Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guests today are Blackjack players KC and Chris Buddy. They produced the must-see Blackjack documentary called Inside the Edge. Gentlemen, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Good to be here. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thanks for having us. KC, this documentary is largely about a year-long road trip where you played blackjack across the country and back, showing the good, the bad, and the ugly. What made you decide to create it? It's a good question. Um, I connected with Chris around 2005. At this point, I was living in Las Vegas um, and playing quite a bit of blackjack. And we, he was an old schoolmate of mine. And at this po- time, I was uh, in school at Berkeley, and I was moving to Vegas, actually, at the time. And uh, I was moving to Vegas with approximately 10 of my classmates. And Chris got wind of this, and he thought that Chris is a filmmaker. He studied filmmaking and thought it was a really interesting story so he moved to Vegas and lived with us at this time filming what was a trailer or teaser for potential docu reality television show so this originally took form as a potential uh, TV show where we would train people as, in a team format and send them out in the world and we'll, you know watch them learning the, the, the skills and then working together as a team but uh, it was hard to get a, a network to pick it up because of the filming in casinos issue. Uh, I'll let Chris expand on that a little bit more. But uh, later, I decided to go leave Vegas. I couldn't play anymore and go on the road. And then it just uh, reignited this conversation. And then Chris joined. And it's a good thing for me because I had a friend with me. Uh, and we spent years together on the road traveling. I will add one funny thing about that was, so, I mean, that was, as Casey said, that's, that was uh, made, the first project was made with the TV show in mind. And we pretty, we got pretty far. That's a tough road to hoe to, to get a show to network or even a series. Um, and Casey was kind of a behind the scenes figure as we were doing that. And then as he, his career was kind of winding down at the same time, he was going to make one last push and, and was talking to me about it the whole time. And I said, I'd love for you to kind of come to the forefront and let me follow you around for a year. And it kind of took some convincing, um, but uh, I think he trusted me and my filmmaking kind of the way I was going to approach it uh, respectfully as I, as I convinced him. And then uh, we just jumped in and went on the road. Uh, and I, I, it actually we started, I filmed a little bit of the tail end of his Vegas career and then jumped down the road in an RV. Actually, I, um, I had a very similar uh, experience trying to do a similar type of show. And at the, at the time, the travel channel, people were jokingly calling it the Vegas channel because they would have Vegas week all the time and they had tons of shows about Vegas. And um, they were aghast at the idea of portraying the casinos in any way that would show them in a bad light because they were major advertisers on the travel channel. So... I mean, it, 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 as you say, it was an extremely difficult task to try to get television interested in those kind of things. But one of the things I wanted to say is I thought you really, really captured the loneliness of being on the road so well. And to the point where Casey had that moment where he – admitted on camera that he was so lonely that he was going back home to get his dogs to bring them with him. And that's having you along with him, Chris. So, um, you know, people can imagine what it's like if you're literally alone on the road. It's a tough Yeah, one. I mean, Casey, uh, if you want to speak to that, I mean, it was. I mean, it's a, it's a grind. And, I, and I, again, I was kind of the, the casual observer. Um, taking it all in and you know this was Casey's world that he let me into but yeah I mean it's uh, if you want I mean Casey can speak to it further but if you want to dedicate yourself like that and, and really kind of move around from casino to casino it, it's it, you gotta you gotta put your life on hold to a certain extent obviously 
it was great having Chris there. I don't think I would have lasted so many years without him. But there's something about uh, going through the emotional experience of playing every day uh, without team members alone, and it's hard. You know, the losses are hard. Chris, you know, he's not in the world. He was really, a, like he said, an, just an observer. Um, so he, you know, I, every experience was truly lonely. Uh, the wins, the losses, the the, the barrings, the every interaction, it, it, it's grind it, and it wears on you. Um, it's not something that uh, I think a, a lot of people would enjoy. Um, but, it, you know, I, it was different for me in Las Vegas. You know, I, I had friends. I had, uh, you know, people I could socialize with, vent to, other players I could talk to. Um, but on the road, it's, you're, it's a one man show and it's, it, it, it's, it's not great. It's tough. No, I've, I've said many times on the show, if I had to play alone, I wouldn't play. Yeah. I was wondering that because obviously our perspective for people who haven't, haven't seen the film are, is, is kind of just one aspect of how people can approach the game of blackjack professionally. I, I, I don't, I don't know how many other people, you know, that have attacked it as a lone wolf. Uh, Richard and Bob, I'm curious to know. Well, um, it's interesting because for for a time, I was saying that I thought card counting really was kind of dying because uh, the communication among the casinos is so much better. But over the last few years, we have had a number of people who basically went out and did exactly what Casey did, where they just go on the road and play, put it in their face until they get thrown out. And we've had several uh, players who have made high six figures, some of them seven figures, doing exactly what Casey did. And I think now people seeing the movie, there are going to be more of them doing it. But... um yeah, I think it's I think it's really hard to do alone, but but they are out there. There are a lot of guys out there doing it. Excellent. So, so Casey, uh, you were on our show maybe six years ago, and you showed Richard and me uh, a rough cut of this movie on an iPad, I think, and it was going to be out in the very near future, and that was six years ago. So, what happened? <laughs> yeah, good. Well. Uh, I'm going to let Chris answer some of this question, but I, I'll just chime in. Um, I think that we, th this was filmed over many, many years. And I think that we ended up with something like 900 hours of footage. And wow. we didn't really realize, and as we edited the film, it took many, we went in different directions. It took many shapes before we got to this uh, final cut that we were comfortable to release. And it was an enormous undertaking. And there were there were a couple other issues along the way. I, I was very uncomfortable with the idea of being out there. Uh, I'm somewhat private. I didn't like – it took me a while to adjust. I didn't like seeing myself on screen, and I may have dragged my feet. Um, Chris is really the filmmaker. So once, you know, the, the adventure was over, uh, Chris, if you want to chime in and talk about all the trials and tribulations we had – making the film yeah and there were many but i'll, I'll stick to kind of the high the highlights <laughs> uh i think when we show when we met with you guys and i had just we'd just come off the road and we kind of and i cut together this teaser to kind of get us excited to so for people again who haven't seen the movie so the, we're following casey along but we also do speak with a number of uh professional and authors and historians and kind of and, and casino personnel to round out the view kind of a broader scope beyond his own personal journey to kind of talk about what it is and the and the relationship between the casino and the advantage player. Uh, so when we came off the road and, and met with you guys, uh, I guess yeah, six years ago, I had just cut this initial teaser to kind of get us kickstarted into post production. But as we went into that, and like Casey said, with the 900 hours um, and with a great editor, you know, with, with story cards and different. I mean, there's thousands of different little directions we could have gone beyond the journey, uh, little side avenues, um, and, and obviously to drag to have something. Uh, drag out that long but really there was really no other way that we could have done this because what I wanted to do and 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 what I convinced KC to kind of open his eyes to is like really show the, the day in day out grind and I don't think we could have done that if I had come in here and there for a weekend oh I'll meet you in 
Biloxi. I mean, to be on the road and get everything. So, I mean, you have to think about, we got so much stuff that isn't in the, I mean, so much garbage that isn't in there. I mean, garbage by garbage, I mean, just stuff that isn't really worth noting, just him playing and playing and playing. It doesn't really, you know, I don't know how many people want to see that for an hour. Um, and then beyond that, there's things that we love that we just had to cut for time. So really, partial, I mean, I will say Casey did drag his feet, and I could tell, and I was very respectful of that we set out on this journey knowing that we're friends and that I was kind of coming along in this private part of his life. So I wanted to be very respectful of that. And I think there might have been a time where this movie wasn't going to come out uh, just because Casey wasn't ready to face kind of putting this private part of his life and obviously wanting to stay under the radar uh, out to the, to the masses. Um, so there's a number of factors, but I mean, here we are now and it's done and, and I couldn't be more proud of the project. And, and, and I think Casey uh, was a great uh, subject for a documentary. What uh, year did you actually start filming and when did you complete filming? So we started the, the once we moved on from the TV idea and, and we got on the road, I think it was about 2010 to 2012. And we did kind of, you know, we, could, we came off the road for uh, holidays and such. But those were the main uh, filming years. And then the editing, and I will add, too, I mean, you know, as, as you know, kind of dealing with casinos, filming in casinos as I did with the button camera, we really needed to, we had a lengthy process of vetting this with um, clearance counsel, with lawyers, to make sure we're at least covered to some extent. Um, not that there's anything, I don't think, too salacious or too, nothing's misrepresented, um, but we definitely wanted to be sure we were, comfortable and our distribution company was comfortable going out there with, with this product. And that, that was also a lengthy product. Lengthy product. Very, very specifically, uh, Richard, we, we did our first, we bought the first camera and started filming in 2005. Uh, but, wow. that was, but that was, uh, we were going in a different direction. You know, we were, we thought we were, it was going to be a TV show and it wasn't, I wasn't even the subject. It was really about these students that were learning how to play the game. Um, it changed into the documentary later, and that happened in 2008 is when I purchased the RV and we started on the road. So I think it was from 2008 to 2012. Oh, wow. The bulk of the journey uh, around the country, and then there was quite a bit of follow-up filming. As Chris mentioned earlier, he has uh, extensive interviews with other players and other gambling authorities and casino personnel, uh, and this was all filmed you know, it, probably in a five-year window. Most of, 90% of it was probably between 2008 and 2012, 13, with some follow-up interviews uh, scattered as late as probably 2017 or 18. And, and can yeah. you describe the, the button cameras and, and how that all worked? Certainly, yeah. So, oh, well, right away I knew that this wouldn't work unless we got – I wanted people to see – what happens in here? I mean, I had seen it being Casey's friend and kind of tagging along a few times. Um, but I don't think there was a movie without actually showing what it is that said, how they act, how everyone reacts and acts. I mean, obviously, this is a relationship. Um, as Michael Shackelford put it, as, it should be a cat and mouse relationship. Obviously, it goes to different uh, uh, types of intensity. But so I knew we needed to at least show that to have this be anything worthwhile. So we did a ton of research and found that there actually were these high res high resolution button cameras that did exist. And it literally is just a small little pocket uh, receiver that you can hit record on and a button camera that literally looks like a button that was on a shirt. And the funny thing is uh, that I, I had one or two shirts that had the button taken out. So when, when you see pictures of me with KC and casinos, surveillance pictures and, and different kind of bolos, I'm always wearing the same shirt. And people must have thought I was insane uh, in the security room. And, and so you were... Um, you were flyered as well. Were you playing or were you just, they were taking your picture because you were seen with him, with Casey? Mainly because I was Casey. A few times, just from my own uh, camera angle, I would sit uh, and he would give me some light signals and, and light uh, betting, the ways to bet and the ways to play the hand. Uh, but that was primarily for uh, uh, different vantages, different cam camera angles to cut into them to film, more so than just uh, me being a proper teammate or player. When you talked about a number of experts, it turns out that there's an enormous number of Gambling with an Edge alumni on this video. I, I count about 15 or so people who've been on this show and are also on video. 
Um, some disguised, some not disguised. And some of the best um, looking ones are in the dark. <laughs> yes, he sounds. A, yes, I got no disguise whatsoever. Uh, different ones got different disguises. Um, Tommy Highland had this, this balloon in front of his face. Uh, James Grossgene had a uh, was in the dark and was sounding like he was in the in a witness protection program with a disguised voice. And those of us who have seen Grossgene with a baseball hat on can look at it and go, "Yep, that's James." Uh, those of us who could see Munchkin, who know what he looks like, and can see him in the shadows, it goes, "Yep, that's Munchkin." But uh, so, how did you decide who was going to be full face, who was going to be partially faced, and various other things like that? How did you get so many of your colleagues to participate? Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer the, the first part, which is uh, I, how we presented people within the film was solely at their request. Um, and obviously, we wanted to have the, the foremost authorities on gambling, whether it be a player who's been on the road for a long time, team members, team leaders, uh, authors, and, and the like. Um, so however anyone wanted to be presented, uh, Richard, for example, his, his voice is out there as we're listening to it today. Uh, but he did not want his face shown, so we blacked out his face. Grosjean and his teammates wanted both uh, blacked out. And Tommy Highland was an interesting one because we shot the interview kind of on a whim. We met him out for dinner, and he said, yeah, let's do an interview. And then after the fact, he said, you know what? I really should have my face blurred out. So that's why his is not shot to be blurred out. But I added a, um, added a, a, a blur later on in post. Um, and how we chose people, I, did, I think at the time, I just picked KC's brain to people he admired and people he knew were out there and books that he had read. Um, so I took that lead. I took that cue to, to, to kind of round out the documentary of whose voice we wanted to add. And, and obviously I, I wanted to show KC going through things, but I, it was important to me to have other people who'd been through it before and who were known and respected in the community to say, yeah, this is what's happening. This is why it's happening. And this is why it's either BS or legit or, or, or this is why this is happening. So I, I felt that was important to have. And everybody on there is making a relevant comment. So you had some of me on, and a lot of my comments are wise-ass comments, but you had me making a relevant comment for which I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't know how many hours on the floor you had to, put, to search to, to find that one relevant comment, but I do thank you for that. <laughs> the interviews that we had with the various uh, participants were excellent. It was really hard to go through, and you know, e each one of those could have been a documentary. And there, you know, everyone so had so many experiences and intelligent things to say. And it, what a shame that we we couldn't have had more. And, and that's just uh, it, Chris did a, a great job accumulating all of these interviews and hearing their stories. And the, the interviews were a lot of fun, where it was really a lot of storytelling, and they could go on for hours and hours. Uh, everyone has so many unique experiences that are so colorful uh, in this world. So uh, who knows? Maybe we can get some of those out in special features or some, in some future format. Oh, well, it also is kind of a testament to the respect people have for you, Casey, that you were able to get the people that you did, because there are not many people who would have been able to assemble that list. Yeah, we were very fortunate that. Uh, but there were, th yeah, thank Munchkin you, Richard. could have gotten that list. <laughs> Definitely. Well, um, so, uh, I, did, Casey, did you have any um, hesitation about some of the things you revealed in the movie. Um, I'm not talking so much about personal things, but about, you know, like your, your description of uh, A sequencing or, or the RFID chip. Not really. If, if you watch the film, the, the goal was to present this to the public. And no one is going to be able to learn how to do count cards, whole card, shuffle track, A sequence, watching this. It's really just... Uh, quick clips that kind of open up the eyes and can can generate ah I I get the idea um, and this stuff is 
is regularly available. People, anyone that was really interested can, can find books, can Google it online. Um, I don't think I gave any secrets. And I felt, you know, we were walking a line where we wanted to be authentic, but at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, do this for a living. And I respect that. And the question I get the most is this, you know, why, do you, why would you want to be out there and expose yourself? Aren't you going to be made? And at this point, you know, I've been playing already for 10 years. And once you're a known entity, uh, it, it was already very, very difficult for me. So that's why you see so many disguises. And, you know, it was quite a bit of an effort for me to play all the time, especially when you're on the road on a certain trajectory around the country. Um, a lot of information is being shared between the casinos. Uh, it, was tr- it was tough for me. So I came to, a very, you know, as an individual lone wolf type player it was I, I was at a point in my career where i knew this is something i could do for the rest of my life and be happy um but no i hope i answer your question um i didn't feel like i was giving away any uh real trade secrets or hurting anybody else and i hope that yeah that. i i thought that the, the disguises were amazing by the way i i i thought that was great and i i love my favorite clip of the movie is that uh, section where it's just like one second clips of Casey saying this rather short speech in all different looks where it just keeps cutting to a different uh, look for him. Uh, I thought that was really a terrific uh, section. Thank you. I will add one thing. I don't know if people are are interested in the filmmaking angle as much, but the way we just because Casey touched upon how his career was ending, and I think that was one of the reasons that I pushed on that that he let me kind of come along is that he knew he wasn't going to uh, be doing this full time as a living for too much longer. Uh, so I kind of leaned on that a little bit. But interestingly enough, the way we presented this was, or, or the way that we approached it is, uh, and I won't ever do this again, I don't think, but just because Casey was allowing me into his world and this world that you guys all live in, um, I allowed him final cut over certain things. Uh, especially uh, some of his likeness and some of the things he gets into. Uh, and we did have these conversations of what we are revealing and how, how far down the road he wants to go. And I think we kind of, I mean, as Casey said, a lot of the stuff is readily available if you do some research. And I don't think we're giving away too much. Uh, but that's the way we framed our own, um, how we approached the film together. Uh, he obviously gave me complete license as the filmmaker and who to talk to, who to include. He gave suggestions. Um, but I did, uh, in fact, give a lot of people have asked this. I did give him a little say over how he's presented because he was kind enough to let me in on this world. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, it looks like it looks like in some places you're changing clothes three or five times a day as you're playing for different looks. I'm assuming going in, you didn't really know all the best um dry cleaners in uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa. So how did you deal with keeping everything clean and uh, stuff like that you're going to? It uh, wasn't always clean. (laughs) That's part of the disguise is the smell. (laughs) Uh, Especially once the dogs came into the picture. I'll tell you, if we did it again, we would need more of the button camera shirts because that shirt got pretty stinky sometimes. Pretty right. So, huh? um, okay. near the end of your trip, you had your dad come out um, and and play with you. How and and you didn't talk a lot in the film about how how he either enjoyed it or didn't or or what his feelings were about. I mean, obviously, he was proud of you and had you know was happy to go on the road with you, but. What was it like for him to be back counting cards again? I think he really enjoyed it. Um, you know, he, he's, he played a lot, but things have changed so much from when he was in his prime uh, playing. The game has changed quite a bit, and he experienced the same thing where he wasn't welcome at, you know, major casinos. But these casinos didn't exist, the casinos we were going to when he played. So it was fun for him to get on the road. He joined us in the Southwest and – uh new mexico and arizona and you know we had a lot of fun doing this together and 
sharing stories and competing and talking and uh it, it was fun for us he he really enjoyed it and i think we won some money together which is always there's some camaraderie there it was fun for me to have a someone else in the rv um it was a new experience for him as well <laughs> uh you know it's a pretty intimate environment so you know we, we it was intense uh and we hadn't done that before you know we we been on vacations we've been stayed together in hotels and gone on trips together and both played and you know we share share stories in the morning or at dinner but never uh living together in the rv like that for so long uh it, it was a lot of fun uh i think it kind of excited him uh he stayed longer than i thought um uh i don't know if he'd do it again but uh it, it was fun i'm glad we included him in it and i'm glad he he was willing to participate I think he, he after Chris and I were on the road for so long, I, you know, we would constantly check in with him, and he, he's always been a, a backboard for me and giving me advice in different situations and how to handle various casinos and heat. Um, so he he was really with us quite a bit along the way. I think that Chris edited in a few of the phone calls, but oftentimes he'd be the first one I'd call when something unusual happened or I had a, a tough interaction with a casino or I didn't know how to handle a certain situation. Um, he's always been my my first call, not just during the film, but probably, in, you know, over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, you know, I didn't uh, – he, he taught me, you know, so he – he got me into this when I was younger, even a teenager, but he, he never meant to. You know, he didn't want me to, to go down this path. So uh, I think the whole thing kind of surprised him, and maybe he was even disappointed when I first started playing. Um, but, yeah, we're definitely close and have, you know, worked through all of our experiences together. When you and talk, when you showed your ahead, dad Bob. in the video, it only, always labeled him as Casey's dad, former world backgammon champion. Why did you choose not to name him other than that? Um, that's a good question. I I don't know that there's a simple answer. I don't think that he wants uh, the notoriety. I don't think it's going to be very difficult to figure out who he is or who I am. Um, but uh, he's also private. I don't think he has any, you know, he never understood it's one thing, uh, when he was playing blackjack, uh, he was somewhat of an innovator, and he, I think it bothered him uh, the amount of publishing that was done. And he's always been very private. Um, I felt lucky that he would even participate in this project. Uh, it's very unlike him. But uh, I think he just wanted to show support. And he's got some great stories, too. You know, he's been around doing this since the, the 60s. So he's... Uh, you know, it was really important uh, to get his take on on it. We went through a little bit of the history, and I think he's – a lot of people, you know, talk about, uh, you know, talk about the various authors that have contributed to the history of Blackjack, and I think he's seen it a little bit different, differently, and we mentioned that in the film. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we gave a nod to Scarney in the film, and I think that's that was one of the guys that in, inspired my father. Uh, I think it was in the you know early '60s uh, as the first person to publicly uh, allude that blackjack could be beaten. And I think that was uh, that's that was something that motivated my father to start doing some work and researching blackjack and trying to develop his own skills and techniques. And I thought that was fun and interesting to include in the film. Actually, you said he has a lot of stories, which I'm sure he does. You think he'd be interested in coming on the show? Uh, I'll ask him. I will, I'll, I'll certainly ask him and see if he'd want to uh, come on. Um, I'd be surprised. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be surprised as well. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah, he's a very private guy. But, hey, uh, you know, I'm sure he has really great stories. So, um, yeah. Yeah, he was playing backgammon in the Bay Area, so he must have played with Nick Maffeo and Nick Ballard and Chuck Propasian, and uh, he would have been in that era. Absolutely. Uh, that was sort of the era that I grew up in. Uh, a lot of our my childhood vacations were just going to backgammon tournaments and following him on the circuit. Is backgammon in your future? Uh, or is it only no, in your past? You know, 
I wish I had more backgammon in my future. I don't have many people to play with, which uh, is a shame. You know, I, I, there just isn't that much backgammon I, in Las Vegas. I need the uh, – it's a great game. It's a great game to play competitively. It's a great game to play with friends. Uh, and I hope that it, there's a resurgence in backgammon in the future because I'd love to play more. Um, so when at, – at the end of the movie, I guess that was 2012 – um, you basically were retired from blackjack. Um, I've often said retiring is easy. I've done it a dozen times. Um, <laughs> so when was the last time you actually played blackjack? I'm guessing it was long after 2012. Correct. Um, uh, I just played, uh, I played about a month ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And- you know, every once in a while, you know, I have other friends that still play and I'm hearing their stories and I get the itch. I did go about a couple of years without playing, which was the longest period for me. Um, and I get the itch. You know, I love to play. Sometimes uh, there aren't many places I can even sit and play in Vegas, but um, I went downtown uh, with, some, with a friend and uh, played two shoes and I had a great time. Uh, it's obviously something you can never really give up. It was fun just to sit and count and see that the skills were still there. It was like riding a bike. Um, and hopefully I'll get some type of international trip in the future. I don't know if this film will affect affect me at all or my ability to play in the future or not. Um, but I'd love to play at some point in the future. I'd hate to think oh, that it's actually, gone Oh, actually... I, I don't know if you want to talk. We didn't talk about this before we started. So if you don't want to talk about it, I, I can cut this out. But um, you had some money stolen from you in a foreign casino for counting cards. Is that something you can share? Yeah. Um, my close friend and business partner, uh, Thomas, and I were playing at the Playboy Club in in London. Uh, he used to live in London and been a member for many, many years. And we would often go to... Uh, there's an, a gaming convention called ICE in January, February, and we go every year. And I'd been playing there as well for probably three or four years. And one trip, uh, uh, we won. We both won. Uh, we had a decent win, and we left money on deposit and went home. And the next night, we came back to play, as we always do. And they wouldn't let us in the club. They uh, revoked our memberships and never let us access these funds we had on deposit. Uh, it was a bit frustrating for me because uh, they just gave me a card one day and said, you're a member. Oh, here, here you are. You know, I never signed anything. I didn't know any terms and conditions. And they said that uh, card counting was against their terms and conditions of membership, uh, which I was never made aware. So we went through a long, lengthy process to try to recover these funds. And it was unsuccessful. We went through an arbitration which was unsuccessful, felt like it was very much skewed towards uh, the casinos and then hired several lawyers. And it really just became, you know, the math of how much we had to spend to try and chase these confiscated funds. But uh, this was at the Playboy Club, which was owned by Caesars. Uh, I have a long history with them. They probably don't like me very much. I don't like them very much. Um, But, yeah, it's really frustrating. You know, that, that, that's, you know, when you play cards like professionally, it's just hard to factor in all the different risk factors. And that's certainly one, you know, where, where a casino will just steal from you. Um, and I would never advise leaving funds on deposit anywhere. That's something that I've, uh, I learned the hard way. But uh, I didn't think that was even an option, that uh, a club that you were to member it would just uh, steal your money and then kick you out and not let you in. But, uh, you know, it was a tough experience. That's a tough loss. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th- when people ask me, do casinos cheat, that's my answer is nowadays the way they cheat is just stealing your money. And Right. I mean, how, how they can offer a, a game of skill and strategy and then claim that you were thinking too much. So there was some arbitrary threshold where, you know, you, can, you have to think, you have to count to some degree just to play basic strategy. At some point, they thought that uh, we were too good. They didn't say we did anything wrong. It's just that we were employing a strategy that they didn't like. 
in a game of skill that they're offering, and they use that as an excuse to to confiscate funds. Um, yeah, really, really strange that Caesars would operate in that way. It's uh, it's unfortunate. I think it's unethical. Um, they have a policy that's pretty clear that uh, card counting is not illegal. Everybody, you know, this is uh, not even up for discussion. And you know, they'll do anything they can uh, to to take advantage of players that they think uh, are a nuisance. Now, in the documentary. Uh I don't think there was ever a back rooming or any kind of rough uh, barring. Did any of that happen, or you were just lucky enough to avoid that? It I avoided. Yeah, it definitely happened. I avoided quite a few situations. You know, as you get more experience, you can you can sense them happening and trying to avoid them. I think in the footage in the film, there was actually one instance in the Midwest where they did try to back room us, but we just uh, kind of walked out and they, they didn't want to get physical and actually force us in the back room. I had a situation at the Bell of Baton Rouge in, Nor- uh, in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where they did physically grab me, drag me down a, a, a flight of stairs aggressively, and they locked me up in the basement of the boat. Um, I had my phone on me, and they handcuffed me to a bench. They, uh, when they left the room, I was able to get my phone out I called 911, told them that I'd been kidnapped and that I was locked in the bottom of the boat. Um, I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. Uh, the, they, they never sent anybody. Um, and then I pulled out the, the iPhone and I was able to film the whole interaction. Uh, this was certainly have made it into the film, but I didn't back it up. And I think four days later, I, I lost my phone. And <laughs> <laughs> oh. and so that the Bell of Baton Rouge escaped an embarrassing uh, situation and <laughs> the, basically the, the casino manager came down it was a lady and she told me that you know they had the right to hold anybody for any reason for as long as they wanted and pretty much just blurted out a bunch of ridiculous stuff that was all being filmed were they uh, also they, say, they said they were making a citizen's arrest on you isn't that didn't they say that up there yeah I mean it's 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 weird they uh, and this happens, and we alluded this, to this a little bit in the film, but what happened at the time is that uh, Griffin had flyered me all over the South, and sometimes these casinos, uh, they, they, they spot someone who's, you know, that they've got a bolo for, they, they grab him, they drag him to, you know, the, to the basement of this boat, and they didn't even know what was going on, right? It was really just we spotted this guy. Um, and I think they held me there for a couple of hours, Then, at which point all they knew is that I'd won. So now they probably went back after the fact while they were holding, detaining me, watching footage and trying to figure out who I was and what was going on. And it's just a, a classic case of them overreacting to these, uh, these flyers. And uh, eventually they just said, okay, you're free to go. Uh, it was really... Uh, it was an uncomfortable situation. I, I did have bruises on my arms, the way they grabbed me and dragged me down these stairs. Um, and it was unpleasant, but it could have been worse. And I know a lot of people that have had worse situations than that. Um, did you consider but, suing them? No, I, I did kind of look into it. Uh, I talked to a, a lawyer in Louisiana. And, you know, he ultimately advised against it. So, all right. right. So if that lawyer advised against it, it is time for us to do a few commercials. The South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. In June, there's a half-price gas and goods promotion. Throughout calendar June, for every 8,334 coin in, instead of getting $25 in cash or free play, you're entitled to a $50 gift card for either Chevron or Walmart, your choice. It's a limit of 10 cards per person for the month. Assuming you value these cards at face value, this means the slot club returns 0.6% for the entire month up for the first $83,000 coin in that you play. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. 
if you sign up for the gold membership, eight ninety five a month or seventy nine ninety five a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is stack the deck. This is a seven coins per line game where dealt hands of trips, quads, full houses, and four to the royal, you receive from three to five extra cards of the exact card needed to make your hand. That is, if you're dealt 33366, three, six, six. instead of having one extra three to make four threes, if you draw to it, now you have six threes out of 52 cards, giving you plenty of chances for four of a kind, five of a kind, and four of a kind with a kicker. They have extra pay schedule category for a baby royal and five of a kind. Since the game is fixed at seven coins per line, Sometimes they have to change the pay schedule to make the game within acceptable bounds. That is, a 964 double double bonus game now becomes 1075, which requires a considerable number of strategy changes to play appropriately. Okay, we're back with KC and Chris Buddy. We recently were talking about being backroomed in Louisiana. There's one scene, at least once, maybe twice, where the casino kicks you out now and you go, okay, all I need to do is cash in my chips and then I'll be on the road and you'll never see me again. And they say, you can't cash in your chips. You have to get out of here now. Take your chips with you. Uh, what happened? Yeah, that we were playing in Tunica, Mississippi, and... Again, uh, I had been flyered, and they were overreacting and trying to make it very clear that uh, I wasn't welcome. And this is another case of them trying. I don't know what they thought I was going to do with the chips. Uh, if I would literally just walk out and never come back and cash them. Um, but it's a casino that uh, is trying to make a point and doing it in somewhat of an unprofessional way. I just I hate it when they act like this. Where, okay, uh, your 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 card counter, you know, a lot a lot of the professional casinos just say, you know, you're too good for us. We appreciate uh, that you're going to beat us, and we ask you not to play. Um, for them to try to confiscate chips, which is common, or tell you you can't cash chips, um, that's what they did. And all you know, I end up calling a gaming agent who comes back and forces them to cash the chips. It's uh, what's annoying is that nothing ever happens to them. That they think that's a normal type of behavior that they can do that and get away with it. It kind of frustrates me. Um, but it, it's extremely common. Just like this uh, Caesar's property in, in London, trying to take a shot and just steal, confiscate money. Um, they, they did it at uh, where was that? That was in uh, I believe there was that was another one at Thunder, well, one at Thunder Valley where they said uh, by law you would have to present a social security card to get your chips. I mean they just kind of throw all these kind of crazy things at you. It seems that's right. They did it at Thunder Valley as well. Uh, I think they took uh, thirty thousand chips and confiscated them, uh, and then made you jump through hoops. You know, asking for things that. Obviously, you didn't need a Social Security card to get the chips back. Um, and they were just looking for excuses to try and confiscate the chips and make us leave without the chips, um, hoping that uh, – I don't know if they're buying time trying to figure things out or they're hoping that we won't come back and just give up the chips. Uh, at that point, we called the police and reported the theft. Uh, and the police came back and, and helped us get the chips. But uh, Yeah, it's a – as you say, it's a free roll for them because they never pay any penalty for for doing it. Right. Um, what about what about traveling with cash? Did you have any problems um, traveling with cash? No, um, I didn't travel with as much cash as it probably seems like in, in the movie, um, and definitely secure it. And I'm, you know, I. It's something you just have to get used to if you're a professional gambler is uh, your bankroll and how you manage it, not just from a betting perspective, but also from a logistical perspective. Um, we had it locked up in the RV, and uh, it's something that you just have to be 
very keenly aware of at all times. Uh, you have to be very aware of where you are, who's around you, who's following you. Um, there were one or two circumstances. I had one issue in, in Biloxi, Mississippi, where uh, we had been down there for quite a while playing and decided it was time to leave, uh, at which point I had built up an inventory of chips at virtually all the casinos in Biloxi. So once we decided we wanted to leave, I didn't want to leave town with this uh, inventory of chips. So I had to go in systematically to all the casinos and, and sort of cash them. And at some point, I think that, uh, and this, you know, this took, a, you know, a whole day to do. Um, and at some point, I realized I was being followed. And I had to call Chris and tell him, you know, when I got back to the RV, there was uh, somebody waiting for me there were somebody's following me and it, it did turn into kind of a sticky situation um but you know if you're aware of it you see it coming you can kind of uh you know you can do your best to try to you know they they knew i was cashing these chips out and they were obviously communicating with somebody else and following me um it was, and were it was these bad guys or casino people i don't bad know guys i think no, they were think just locals <laughs> I think wow. they were connected to the casino. So I don't think they were connected to a casino, but they were probably connected to a casino employee who who tipped them off. Wow! And this is just a a guess. Well, also, I mean, it maybe it started happening a little after this period, but there are a lot of traffic stops now where they just, again, it's a free shot where the police just pull you over for nothing and then say, you don't mind if we search your vehicle. And if oh, they wow. find cash, they confiscate it. Um, so, but it sounds like you avoided that. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, the, the cash has been criminalized. It's, uh, it's tough to, you know, for, it's unusual for people to carry large amounts of cash. Let's just say that. So more often than not, they're, they're coming across something rather than running into a professional gambler who's traveling around the country playing cards. Um, and it's, it's unusual. Um, I, it, it's every day it gets a little bit more comfortable and a little bit harder. Um, just the other day on a domestic flight, I had a problem where, uh, it didn't used to be a problem, uh, traveling around the country with cash and I've been stopped to explain it to some of explain it. And then they let you go, uh, when they do see it. But um, now they are they're becoming more aggressive, even domestically. So I will say, well, well, sorry, Go ahead, Chris. Oh, sorry, Richard. Uh, yeah, Richard, I was just going to say uh, uh, to the uh, again, speaking to the thing, all the great things we had to cut. We did have a sequence kind of delving more into the money. We did show it. Um, I think he went to Vegas one time and picked up cash. And we cut, just because I know I, we wanted to touch upon or I wanted to touch upon kind of that whole thing of traveling with cash and the demystification of that. But he did, there were many times where he kind of would just go back to Vegas during his winning and kind of take cash down and just have a, a quick day in, day out flight. Um, and that was an edited sequence, again, that we had to cut for time because there were so many other great moments to include. Right, but there was at least one uh, scene where he had to go back to pick up cash. And, and, and actually, that's another thing that I really liked about the film was I thought it really showed what a long losing streak can look like and feel like emotionally. Um, you know, too many blackjack movies or gambling movies, everybody just always wins all the money. And, um, you know, uh, you had that long losing streak, which um, is just part of the game. And I thought it, it really portrayed that really well. I don't know if that's Casey's favorite scene of the movie. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> The the going to get the cash or just going no, through just the losing. The, the the losing. losing oh yeah, yeah the losing. I don't know if you like that scene, but uh, I, I was whatever. We just, we, I, the documentary playing out like uh, bringing down the house where I was just going to win every single day to, for the whole trip. I was hoping it would work out like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're not playing blackjack full time anymore. So what are you doing? What did you move on to? Um, I've always been interested in gaming, so. I've done more in the, the finance and deal making around the gaming industry, um, private equity and advisory. Um, we worked on, uh, I've had a partner for, 
for several years, and we worked, uh, who I went to school with, and we did our financial engineering degrees together, and he's, he's actually in the film. Uh, we worked together to consult on the sale of a major sports book and then finance some sports betting software uh, in Vegas. Uh, next, We consider next generation uh, mobile sports betting. And right now, uh, I'm working on a project. Hopefully, if things go well, I'll be opening a, a licensed online sports book and casino in Mexico by the end of the year. Uh, if if everything moves continues to move sl- uh, smoothly, um, so that's the project that's taking up most of my time right now. Wow! So if a, a licensed online sports book in Mexico would that only allow Mexican clients, or would it be open to the world? Uh, our, our goal is to move south into Latin America. Um, everyone's really excited about the U.S. right now, but I actually uh, am more excited about Mexico and and Latin America as these markets are opening up very quickly. So right now we're going to operate in Mexico, facing Mexico and that market, uh, and then hopefully move into uh, either Brazil or Argentina uh, as these markets develop. Huh. For people who want to purchase or rent this documentary, where do they find it? So, yeah, Inside the Edge, a professional blackjack journey, a professional blackjack adventure is uh, readily available. You can get it on most cable providers through video on demand. It's available to rent or buy through iTunes Store and also, uh, I'm just listing off the main places, uh, Amazon Prime or if you want a DVD or Blu-ray on Amazon. But uh, it's, it's available a lot of places. Microsoft sells it, I think, uh, Roku. And there's, there's a lot of, that's the great part about distribution. Uh, Richard, as I'm sure you know now, has just opened up wild, widely. Um, so you can get a film out there to be readily available, independent film at that. Yeah, I saw it on YouTube, by the way. That's where I uh, Oh, there you go. Up, yeah, so. that's, a, that's, that's a newer one, yeah. And I saw it. I have Cox Cable, and I do, was just on demand. So um, and I saw it there. It's all over the place. <laughs> so if you are a blackjack player, or even somebody who wishes to gamble with an edge, this is a documentary you do want to see. Uh, it, it should not even be a close decision. Um, Casey, Chris, we will thank you both for your time. This was very interesting. I hope your video does well. I think putting out a video to uh, get you a nomination for the Blackjack Hall of Fame is kind of sneaky, but it might work. Uh, <laughs> And Thanks. this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, Bob and Richard. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you both. It was a great time. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>